For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. If you would like to support the channel and become part of our ancient history fan community, visit patreon.com slash world of antiquity. Welcome to Trowelocity, a new video series in which we talk with archaeologists and ancient historians about their work. In this episode, we'll be speaking with Egyptologist, writer, and broadcaster Chris Naunton. We're going to speak all about his books, TV shows, expeditions. Uh, but before we do, please show your support for the series by pressing the like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Okay, let's talk archaeology. With me today is someone whose years of research has focused on the Libyan and Kushite periods in ancient Egyptian history, as well as on the history and development of the field of archaeology in Egypt and its presentation to the public. He studied Egyptology at the universities of Birmingham, Birmingham and Swansea and has done archaeological field work in Luxor and South Abydos. He has taught Egyptology at University College London, SOAS University of London, Birkbeck College, Bloomsbury Summer School, uh, Komazawa in, in Tokyo, Melbourne Universities, and he regularly gives public lectures throughout the UK, including at the British Museum, the Oxford Literary Festival, and the BBC History Festival. During the pandemic, he's been offering online lectures. For 16 years, he worked for the Egypt Exploration Society and was its director from 2012 to 2016. He was president of the International Association of Egyptologists from 2015 to 2019. He currently serves as director of the Robert Anderson Research Charitable Trust, a London-based charity that provides support to visiting academics. He's the author of several books, including Searching for the Lost Tombs of Egypt, and most recently, Egyptologist Notebooks, which came out this past October. But you may have seen him on TV. He has been presenter on the documentaries Flinders Petrie, The Man Who Discovered Egypt, Tutankhamun, The Mystery of the Burnt Mummy, Tut's Treasures, Hidden Secrets, Egypt's Lost Pyramid, and King Tut's Last Mission. Please welcome with me, Dr. Chris Naunton. Thank you for being with us, Chris. Thank you very much for, for having me. Thanks for the invitation. Glad to have you. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question that I ask uh, everybody at the beginning, um, and that is, uh, what made you want to be an archaeologist? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I, I think, actually, if anything, I, I feel like first and foremost, I'm a historian. Um, I, you know, I'm interested in all things. I'm interested in all things historical. But I remember uh, one moment in particular when, as a cocky sort of 17 or so year old, asking my history teacher at the time I was doing my A levels at school in the UK, "Why can't we study the ancient world, sir? Now, why do we always have to do the Tudors? Or we were doing the Tudors and the French Revolution at the time, and those are things which which interest me. But I, I, I remember that I remember this because I can remember you know this being a sort of a uh, rare moment when I challenged uh, a teacher at school. And it's, I know from that that I must have already had a hankering for the ancient world. And that took me to university to study ancient history and archaeology. And, and of course, so much of the source material, so much of the evidence we have for that bit of history comes actually from archaeology. So I got into fieldwork and um, archaeological techniques from there. I did a little bit of, of what a lot of archaeologists would consider something else. I did a, a lot of um, uh, studying ancient uh, languages and texts as well. But to me, you know, I think it all comes under the, the banner of, of archaeology. So really, it's a fascination which goes back longer than I can really remember um, in the ancient world. And, and did you always love Egypt the most or that just something that you kind of moved over into? I think I did. I think I did. And again, I, I can't really I can't really be absolutely sure about this, but you, you know, ki kids have a fascination, as we all do, with with Egypt. And and I must have studied it as a kid. I'm also very fortunate that I grew up within striking distance of the British Museum. So uh, you know, I was taken there by my family, but there were school visits as well. Um and, and I, you know, I I, I guess. The Egyptian things are the, are the most popular exhibits in the British Museum. And like everybody else, I guess I was hooked. I, I mean, when I went to university to study seriously, I had the choice of doing Egyptology or you know pursuing that line or ancient Near East, the Greek world, the Roman world, um, 
Roman Britain, medieval Britain. I could have even done industrial or forensic archaeology, but still it was Egypt that hooked me. Um, I, I, and again, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure I can explain that, but, I'm, but from very early on in that degree, I, I was decided that's what I, that's what I want to try and do. How did you um, get into the study of the third intermediate period uh, and who did you study under? So that, that's actually easier to explain. I, um, to take the second part of the question first, I studied under Dr. Anthony Leahy, uh, who was uh, the, the principal Egyptologist at the University of Birmingham where I studied. And he uh, has made his research career in the study of the first millennium BC and in particular of the, the period that corresponds to Manetho's 21st to 25th dynasties, um, which for one reason or another, we, we you know, probably better referred to as the Libyan and Kushite periods. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that era, that part of Egyptian history is, is relatively poorly understood and there are relatively few specialists. Um, so naturally, Tony's students, the ones at least who go on to further study beyond an undergraduate degree, often find themselves um, focusing on those periods. So I inherit it from my supervisor. That's a very, um, uh, uh, not very well known period, right? It's, it's not well documented, is that right? And the chronology is kind of un uncertain. Yes, the Libyan and, and Kushite periods are relatively poorly understood. Um, there are time when we, so, so our knowledge of history is kind of based on and dependent on um, an ancient framework of dynasties um, which comes from a writer called Manetho, who, who wrote a history of Egypt in the early Ptolemaic period, not very long after the last of those 30 dynasties. Um, and although, you know, naturally he was writing, when it comes to the very earliest periods of Egyptian history, he was writing about events that took place almost 3,000 years before his own lifetime. So he was dependent on, actually for the time, fantastic sources in temples, temple archives, but of course his, his history was flawed, naturally. And yet we, we've inherited that and we still use it. Um, and for some parts of Egyptian history, the, the, the parts when the state was most centralized and stable, when it's clearest what was going on, you've got one pharaoh ruling over the whole country and, and beyond. It's when um, the, the state was less centralized and Egypt less stable and wealthy and powerful. And in some cases, um, during those times, the country split that's when things become much more confused and Manetho's archives clearly must have been much less reliable. So because we still, we still depend on his system, when it comes to those periods, we find that the archeological evidence doesn't really back it up very well, mm. which is why um, even specialists in the period like me, when it, when it comes to uh, talking about it, aren't even really sure what labels to use because the, uh, unlike, unlike those great periods of centralization where we can say with confidence, such and such a thing happened in the middle of the 18th dynasty or the 19th dynasty, when it comes to the period corresponding to dynasties 21 to 25, they overlap a bit. 24 doesn't really exist. Scholars argue about whether 23 was based in the north or it was based in the south or whether there was actually more than one line of kings that should be called 23. Um, and it's for this reason that the labels Kushite and Libyan are, are actually better. But, but that whole little explanation in itself kind of perhaps gives you an idea that uh, is a, I always refer to it as a confused and confusing period. Yeah. Um, and scholars are still arguing about how we should we should try and use what evidence we have to reconstruct what happened. Is it is it correct to say that the Egyptians viewed the Libyans as uh, insiders and the Kushites as outsiders, or is it a little trickier than that? That's a very good question. Um, it is, I think, a little bit more complicated than that. But you touch on a very what's a very interesting point there, which is that while these groups of of people were in some sense foreign, um, there were actually multiple groups of people who fall under our, our name for them, Libyans. They came, we think, from the, from the west of Egypt. Um, they were various nomadic groups who came to settle in Egypt towards the end of the New Kingdom and ultimately became influential enough that they provided a whole sequence of, um, of individuals who became pharaoh. Um, but they were acculturated um, we, we might say Egyptianized 
So uh, in in many respects, they were they were Egyptian. They were culturally Egyptian, and yet they retain enough of their original identity one way or another. For example, in personal names, um, for us to see that they were originally from somewhere else, or you know, descended from people who came from somewhere else. The same is true of of the Kushites. Um, the Kushites were a group from Sudan, what is now Sudan. Um, and the name Kush refers to the territory. It was also, it was a kingdom. Um, in that case, um, they had become Egyptianized at a time when this their territory was absorbed into the Egyptian empire. Um, so they, in fact, um, took Egypt over, becoming the 25th dynasty of Egypt. And, and they did so as, in their minds, the true Egyptians, oddly enough. So, so both these groups were, uh, as I say, sort of acculturated. And, and in Egyptology, we use the word Egyptianized. Um, and yet they, as I say, in both cases, they retain certain elements of their original identity. As far as the Egyptians were concerned, I think the Egyptians themselves were concerned, both groups were foreign. Um, and to that extent, or to some extent, therefore, the enemy, if you like. Yeah. Um, but what I think one of the most interesting aspects of the period is to what extent, or what, what the nature of that dynamic was. Was it entirely one of antipathy between the two groups, or was there, I, I, th and I think this is probably closer to the truth, a, a bit more negotiation involved, as well as pure rivalry and um, antagonism between the two Mm -hmm. um, and, and the fact, the fact of both those groups of so-called foreigners being a cultural, acculturated to, to Egypt, I think is important in that. Um, yeah, it's a fascinating period. Yeah, and as I understand it, you did some uh, work early on at, at Luxor and Abydos, and I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that. Were there any significant discoveries made there at the time? Sure. Uh, the, uh, the first place I worked was South of Bidos. I, I worked there with a University of Pennsylvania project, um, it's, uh, which is actually part of the broader Penn, um, Yale, NYU, um, Abydos family of projects. And this was a, a project directed by Dr. Joseph Wegner, who's at Penn. Um, and De uh, Joe's focusing on um, the tomb, temple complex and town of uh, the late Middle Kingdom, um, the time of Sanusret III. So when I was there, Joe was excavating the town that sprang up around the funerary cult of the king. So after he died, um, at, at, at he was at, there was a tomb constructed and a temple, and the maintenance of that temple and the cult led to an entire settlement developing. And we're we're very short of settlements, relatively speaking, in Egypt. They're not very well preserved. We don't have relatively speaking, we don't have that much evidence. So it was a very good opportunity to investigate that this side of life in ancient Egypt. Uh, quickly, was his tomb a pyramid? Uh, so he actually has, he, he does have a pyramid at Dashur, which is part of the wider Memphite necropolis. He also has a rock cut tomb at Abydos, and it's to this day unclear which of those was actually the place in which he was buried and, and, and what the function of the other one was mm -hmm. if it wasn't his burial place. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to see. So, um, so in the case of Abydos, no, it was actually a rock cut tomb descending into the bedrock at the at the foot of um, the holy mountain at Abydos, Anubis Mountain. And in that sense, actually, it's been argued by Joe and others, I think, that um, this is this is possibly the beginnings of the Valley of Kings type tomb. Um, the Valley of Kings comes into use in the 18th dynasty, and these are these are subterranean tombs cut into the bedrock. And Sanusret the Third's Abydos tomb is one of the first royal examples of, of that tomb type. Um, so I was actually working there. Again, I have my supervisor at Birmingham, Anthony Lee, to thank for that. I just went and buttonholed him when I was halfway through a master's degree and said, look, I, I Tony, I'd like to work in the field. I, I didn't call him Tony. I said, Dr. Lee. Can I? I'd like, I'd like to work in the field. Can you? Can you help me out? And he gave me the um, address. I think it must have been the postal address or maybe email address. It was a long time ago. <laughs> um, of, uh, of 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 I think five field directors who he thought might be sympathetic to a, a master, very enthusiastic master student, asking for experience. And Joe um, 
was the one who was able to take me on. And despite not knowing me, with only a recommendation from Tony, uh, took me out there to, to basically to draw pottery for a month, which was, I have to say, not the most exciting thing I've ever done in, in my career, uh, but fabulous experience, absolutely fabulous experience. And from there, and forgive me if this is a very long answer, from there, um, a colleague of mine, by this time I'd taken a job at the Egypt Exploration Society, and a colleague of mine there said, uh, was I going to go and work with Joe again? And, and I'd said that for various reasons, no, I, I, I didn't think that I would be able to. And so she said, well, where would you like to work? And I, I didn't really realize that was where the conversation was going, but I said, well, I mean, you know, I have an interest in um, the 25th dynasty in particular, the Kushite period in particular, and um, there are a, there's a group of, of tombs of that period in, in Luxor. So, I mean, I suppose if you're asking me where, where would I like to work, you know, in dreamland, then I'd tell you the 25th dynasty tomb of Harwa. And she said, okay, fine, I'll go and talk to the director, which is not what I was, you know, I wasn't angling for this or anything, but she did it anyway. <laughs> and I think probably bullied him into taking me on. And so I ended up working for several seasons for uh, Francesco Tiradritti, who's the director of the Italian archaeological mission to Luxor. And his concession actually takes in three uh, tombs, in fact, um, the tomb of Hawa, a 25th dynasty chief steward of the God's wife of Ammon. Um, another tomb, which is part of the same complex, which is built for Hawa's successor, Archamonry, of the later 25th dynasty. And it, it, the concession also includes the nearby tomb of Pabaza, uh, a holder of the same office in the next period, the 26th dynasty. F fabulous part of the world. Um, Great contrast to Abydos. Um, in Abydos, I was, I was living in the American dig house in the desert, and we barely saw any other human beings, um, you know, other than the, the team members most of the time. Whereas in Luxor, there might be 20 archaeological missions working in the area at any one time, you know, and you've got a big city over the other side of the river. If you need to get away and just get some luxury for a bit, you can go and sit in McDonald's in the air conditioning with a big Coke if you want to. Whereas at Abydos, you know, <laughs> we didn't even have electricity in half the house. So, yeah, it was a big contrast. But but also Luxor is so rich archaeologically. And I was working in a monument of the period that I was studying. So it was, it was fabulous. Nice. So um, uh, what made you switch over into like a more administrative work is that what was kind of a career decision where you um you didn't continue to, to go down the route of i'm just going to do excavations i'm going to lead uh, excavations but i'm gonna i'm gonna be a director or something like that or or am i missing something or did you did you continue to do that no no you're right um no i so i took a job at the egypt exploration society um more or less straight after my master's degree what I, this was almost a sort of accident as well really what what i was intending to do was to take a gap year after finishing my master's um i was persuaded by a supervisor um dr lisa montagna lee that i should go away for a while she thought i was too young to start a phd i was 21 uh, 21 when we had this conversation um, she thought I was too young to start a PhD and I had no life experience and I didn't know anybody outside the Department of Ancient History and Archaeology at Birmingham. So she said, she said, go away and get some work experience. So this is where the idea of going to work at Abydos came from. And I also um, wrote to all the museums with Egypt, Egyptian collections um, in the UK to try and get work experience. And I also applied for every job going with no expectation of getting anything other than experience of filling out application forms. And to cut a long story short, um, to my astonishment, halfway through that supposed gap year, I got a very lowly, very junior administrative job at the Egypt Exploration Society. So I took it and, um, and, I, and I loved it. Um, it allowed me to keep, you know, to keep my, my, my toe in Egyptology while actually earning a living like a real grown up. <laughs> um, and... Um, yeah, I, I, I guess so. For the for a few years there, I was doing my field work. I actually started my PhD part time while I was there, and I started doing things like I was getting asked to do a bit of teaching, getting asked to do a bit of writing. I got asked to accompany um, specialist tours to Egypt after a while. So I felt like I was doing my Egyptology, but my role at the ES was all to do with public engagement and trying to raise support and funds for the ES's archaeological work through 
the program of lectures and publications and eventually um online things social media so um and i and you know and actually a, a little bit of administration on the on the side is perfectly sort of acceptable you know for for me um so i kind of i guess i felt as though i was doing all those i was get, keeping all those things in balance yeah um, and after a few years the opportunity to actually to become the director of the es the ceo came up and and that really was um uh an administrative position that didn't leave me very much time for Egyptology, but I was very, very pleased to do that for a few years. Um, but after I'd been, I'd been going at that for about five years, I took the decision to go freelance so that I could get back to what I, what by that time I decided I really wanted to do actually, which was writing and, mm -hmm. uh, and media work. So, so that, yeah, that's, that brings us up to date. So uh, for, for, for students who are in archeology span or pursuing archeology, span um, this kind of route that you took, would you recommend that this is a good way to, 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 to um, use um, this, um, this expertise or whatever, uh, to, if you're on the archeological path? Or do you, do you think, well, maybe, maybe going uh, into administration is not the best idea or, you know, what-, what Well, I think, it, I think it's, it's really suited me. I, you know, I, I, um... I guess I started studying Egyptology in 1996 at the University of Birmingham, so that's 25 years ago. Um, and I started at the EES in 2001, so that's 20 years ago. And here I am, you know, 20 years later, 25 years later, depending on where you draw the line. And I really enjoy what I do. Um, I'm making a living from, you know, from from uh, from doing Egyptology in, in my way. Yeah. Um, it seems to be the the current uh, trend these days is to. Um, you know, you don't have to go through the traditional institutions. You can uh, branch out on your own and do it freelance. Um, I think I think there's probably yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. I, th I think I think there's probably more opportunities for that now, maybe than there have been in the past. Um, for me, I kind of feel like, may, you know, in in my case, I think that is that's probably partly to do with the fact that the web and social media has made it possible for people to um write create content um publish content you know get, or reach an audience um without having to to you know to be based in an institution or to partner with a, a publisher or a tv company or whatever it is so i think there's a little bit of that um having said that you know i think my my sort of career path is quite unusual mm -hmm. like i say it suits me i think that i think in terms of whether or not i would recommend it i think i think here are the things to just sort of bear in mind. Yeah, I enjoy it. It is quite unusual. I don't. I think it would be quite difficult to plan to do this. Yeah. Um, but I think the the two things that I that ha have helped me to get to this point where I enjoy what I do are one. Um, I've always had it in mind that um, the moment I'm not enjoying it anymore, then I want to change it. So if I'm really honest, actually, I, I, I did love my 16 years at the Egypt Exploration Society, but at the end of 16 years, I was ready to go. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, I thought that was quite possibly a job for life. Um, and actually, after five years of being the director, I didn't want to do any more management and, you know, budgets and spreadsheets and that kind of stuff. I wanted to get back to ancient Egypt. And in my mind, if I hadn't been able to make a freelance career, then I was going to have to leave Egyptology altogether. But I was prepared to take that risk yeah. in order to do what I, to something I enjoyed. So I think if you know, if I had, a, if if this was to take the form of sort of advice, I'd be saying, always bear in mind that Egyptology, archaeology, these kinds of things are not a career that you go into um, for lots of money or job security or that sort of thing. You do it because you love it. So as long as you, as long as you're enjoying it, it's fine. As soon as you're not enjoying it just have a think about whether or not it's time to change. The other thing I think I would say is you've got to take your opportunities. So I did do plenty of work for free, you know, plenty of volunteer stuff. I did do plenty of work that wasn't very well paid. Um, I never have earned, a, you know, a ton of money doing anything, but, but perfectly enough for, to keep me happy. But like I say, it, it's not a job that makes you rich, but I've taken the opportunities. So I know that a lot of people, um, a lot of graduate Egyptologists and archaeologists probably wouldn't have taken a very badly paid junior administrative job 
uh, like I did when I was 22, but it served me really well. You know, I, yes, I did have to lick stamps and put them on the envelopes at the end of every day. And I did have to go to the post office and do all the dog's body things that you have to do as a, as a junior, but I stuck at it. Um, I, I mean, I enjoyed it anyway. Um, and opportunities came my way. Like I say, people started saying, well, you've got a degree and you're working here in the office. Why don't you come and give us a lecture or what, you know, would you like to write an article about the project you're working for? And would you like to come on this excavation and all those things? And, you know, after a while, Hey, presto, you, you know, you're doing it. How did your uh, television opportunities come about? Um, well, again, actually, you know, I sort of by accident, (laughs) um, when I was at the ES, um, we had a very good research library there, which was not exactly open to the public, but it was open to anybody who became a member. And to become a member of the ES cost about 48 pounds, uh, British pounds per year. So for television companies making documentaries, uh, you know, that's a drop in the ocean for the opportunity to, to come and use a, a library of about 23,000 uh, Egyptology items with a specialist Egyptology librarian. So uh, that was my role at the time. So the TV companies used to come in and, and, and I, would, I would be essentially helping them with their research. Um, and I did that because it was part of my job and because I thought it was fun. And, and also because I, I guess I was thinking that if I got on side enough, then eventually I might persuade them to feature the EES in a TV program. And that would be great for our efforts to raise the profile and raise awareness and that sort of thing. Um, and I guess eventually that kind of happened. You know, I, 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 um, I offered uh, one of our rooms up to, a, to a B, the BBC, actually, who were making a big documentary at the time. Um, I arranged for them to meet some of our archaeologists. So in other words, I was, you know, I was obviously very useful to them, I, I guess, at this point. And it turns out, I didn't know this at the time, but the BBC was going to be making a kind of spin-off documentary um, about Flinders Petrie. And I guess they were at this time looking for um, presenters who came not from a professional TV presenter background, but from a specialist expert background. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I guess they they just thought maybe, you know, I would be good for this. So I was just asked, like the BBC just asked me if I'd like to do it. And of course I jumped to the chance. I had to do a screen test. Um, I had to be approved by the channel controller. Um, that worked and uh hey presto i did uh, that was my first proper film and of course i i guess i didn't completely screw that up so whenever people came to the es after that um as they as i was saying as they as they always did suddenly they would be saying oh well and of course by the way i mean we'd love you to be in it uh as well and and um so yeah over the years i i guess um my number has made its way into the into the the dress book of all of these TV companies and producers. And now fortunately enough, well, over the years, I've often got the call. So they, um, they, they come to you with the, uh, the subject matter and then you, you're hired on as a presenter. So you're not the one that comes up with the, the idea for the, the documentary. Is usually. No. Um, I, I have, um, I have been involved in, um, in, in coming up with ideas and then pitching, okay. um, ideas as well. Um, but, so they, they basically said, oh, King Tut's popular. Let's do a King Tut. And you ended up making three of them, as I, as I recall. Is that right? Three. I've made a, yeah, I've made a, um, <laughs> a one, two, four, four, four different Tutankhamun uh, things, one of which was a three-part series. So if you count that as three, it's actually oh. six. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. But that's um, because King, King Tut is popular. And, um, yeah. I yeah. It, and it, it, the key thing is it rates well. Mm-hmm. So to explain actually how it, how it works... The first conversation is, um, it is true that sometimes somebody like me could go to a TV production company and say, hey, look, I've got this incredible, incredibly exciting research. You know, would you like to make a film? Or, you know, I might announce some incredibly exciting research and then, you know, and then the TV companies will say, oh, my goodness, we'd love to make a program. I haven't, I haven't done that research uh, myself. Um, most of the time what happens is that the... Um, Production companies, the execs from the production companies will talk to the channel controllers. So that will be the people who hold the, the budgets at National Geographic, Discovery, uh, PBS, BBC in the UK, Channel 4, Channel 5, SBS in Australia, France 5, you know, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and the, the channels will say things like, yeah, you know, do you remember we did that thing about King Tut? That was really great. You know, we had loads of viewers. Could you could you do another one? Or can, can we have a series about that? And what we want is we want new discoveries and we want science and, you know, we want something, blah, blah, blah. Can you go away and figure that out? So the, the production companies then go off and probably talk to somebody like me and say, Chris, look, they've asked us to do two Duncan Men. What can we do? Um, can we do something about the mummy? Um, can we do something about the tomb? You know, what, what can we do? Um, and so there's a kind of dialogue and the, um, there'll be a lot of toing and froing, and eventually uh, there'll be a commission. Um, and, and, you know, and then I come on board um, and I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to be involved in the research, um, which, is, which usually means answering questions. There'll be researchers working for the television companies, but, you know, hi, Chris, you know, I'm trying to find this or I'm trying to find that, or do you know if anybody's doing this or that? And, and then eventually as well, there will come a point where, where we're filming and, um, and I will be, in some cases, the sort of lead person, in some cases, the presenter, in some cases, just one of a group of people who's, who's invited out to say this and that. Um, so, you know, it, it varies, but it's... Um, it's a process of negotiation and discussion and a lot of compromise as well. Um, it's certainly one, if there's anybody out there who thinks that somebody like me just sort of walks into, uh, let's say, National Geographic and says, so, okay, guys, this is what I want to do this time. It does not work like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Does, does uh, In the course of making the documentaries, uh, does do new things come to light or is it just kind of... Um, giving a survey of what is already known in Egyptology? Uh, that is also a really good question. Um, I'd say most of the time it's the latter, actually. Um, I think the thing we have to remember is that um, the programs are being made for a broad audience. Yeah. Um, so, the, you know, ideally a, 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 for a film to succeed, um, you might, you, there might be something that's of interest and new to specialists there will be things that are new to the, the enthusiasts, the hardcore. Um, but but the people you really want are uh, the people who are sitting there on the sofa with the remote in their hands thinking, do I want Egypt or do I want Jersey Shore or do I <laughs> the football or what do I want? You know, and, they, and the, the way the program makers think about it is that you've got a minute maximum or 30 seconds or something at the start of the program before people will switch over. So you've got to get them in that one minute. That's why up the front, you always have people like me saying, it's the most exciting discovery ever made. You know, you've got to get them in that moment. Um, so where am I going with this? Uh, what was the question? Uh, the question oh, was about whether any any new information comes to light. Oh, sorry. Yes, Thank sorry. You. Forgive me, David. Um, yeah, so... so uh, one key sort of aspect of that is you can't say tonight, you know, on National Geographic, something everybody already heard about 10 years ago, you know, <laughs> it's got to be new. Um, it might well not be that new to the insiders. The it's insider. new to the audience. Yeah. It's new to the audience. Exactly. <laughs> um, so most of the time, you know, it's not that new, but, but I have also been involved in films, which, and this is what, this is like the Holy grail for the production companies and the, and the channels. Uh, I have been involved in a few things which have actually followed more or less live archaeological fieldwork mm -hmm. um, where really genuinely, you know, something is revealed that is that is brand new. So I was in a film um, which was shown in the UK and, and internationally. In the UK first, I think, towards the end of 2019 and then internationally in the weeks following that. Uh, it was called Egypt's Lost Pyramid in, in the UK and... We were there filming when um, the burial chamber at the center of what was a pyramid was opened for the very first time, uh, you know, really genuinely. Um, and that was, that was amazing. I think that was, in some ways, that's the best, that's the best TV thing I've ever done because um, it was such an incredible privilege. And it's only because of TV that I was there. You know, my, I was president of the International Association of Egyptologists at the time. That would have made no difference whatsoever, I'm afraid. It, you know, it's just the fact that I was involved with the TV film that allowed me that privilege to be there. Um, so so sometimes, sometimes the TV is able to make things like that happen. Um, and, and in that sense, actually, uh, archaeology and, and the world of TV can be a much more productive collaboration, I think, than sometimes people realise. And a fabulous thing to be involved in. Yeah. 
So I know you, you, you're you interested in the history of Egyptology, and I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your latest book, Egyptologist Notebooks, um, and what's in there. Well, thank you for asking. Yeah. Um, yes, Egyptologist Notebooks came out um, towards the end of last year. So um, aside from anything else, I'm just very grateful that I had pretty much finished bar dotting a few I's and crossing a few T's. I'd finished my work on it before the virus hit. Um, because the whole project would have just ground to a halt otherwise. Um, and the and the book came out, you know, during the during the pandemic, which 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 was great. It gave me something to do that I could do from a desk at home. Uh, whereas the research meant going to libraries and archives and just couldn't have happened. Um, as I say, you know, had it been six months, the process been six months later, the the, the book would still be on the on the desk now. Anyway, um it's Egyptologist Notebooks is um, is a is a kind of overview history of archaeology and travel and discovery and Egyptology in Egypt, as told through the archives of thirty odd of what seemed to me to be the most interesting, um, influential, important, and colourful characters. Um, so it is uh, it is a kind of visual celebration if you like of of the story of how we come to know what we know about ancient egypt um it's a, it's a book of archive material photographs notes plans maps drawings sketches paintings where, where um, did you find all this uh this material well um i i i guess over the years i i have just come to know um where where such archives are and and I mean, I had to do a lot of research, but um, I had a head start in that I knew that just in the UK, within easy reach from where I was based in London, um, you have some very, very rich archives, such as the one at the Egypt Exploration Society, um, the archives of the Petrie Museum at University College London, the archives of the British Museum, the British Library, um, and then the Griffith Institute and also the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Um, if I'd only used those archives, I could easily have written, uh, you know, a book full of very beautiful images. Um, the publisher was very keen that it should be more international than that, which is why uh, we also raided archives, which are in a whole number of, uh, of other countries, including Egypt, although not as many from Egypt as I would like. That's a story in itself. Um, but, France, Germany, um, Italy, the US, um, and various other places as well. Uh, so yeah, it's, I mean, it's by no means comprehensive. There'd be far too much to put in it um, otherwise, but um, I, I really, I was really confident, pretty confident, I think, at the outset of the project that we would be able to include lots of really stunningly beautiful material, which the vast majority of people would, would never have seen before. And there was the opportunity alongside this to just tell, to say something about the, the history of Egyptology. And I, I think, dare I say it myself, I think, I think, I think the book does a decent job of that. Who, who are your favorite Egyptologists of old? Oh, that's a, that is a nice question. Um, <laughs> uh, Everyone always one, talks about Flinders Petrie. Is he one of, do you think he's one of the greats or? Um, he, uh, he is, yeah, he, he is certainly one of the greats. Um, Petrie, Petrie's energy and his resourcefulness and his capacity to invent ways of doing things in order to solve problems um, really sets him apart from everybody else, I think. Um, uh, I wouldn't want to say he's the, the greatest archaeologist, you know, who ever worked in Egypt or anywhere. Um, but he was certainly a pioneer in many respects. His work is, is you know, judged by the standards of today, flawed in some respects. Um, but his work and his published reports are fundamentally important to the study of so many different sites in Egypt. Um, it, it's staggering. You know, his name just comes up again and again and again and again, wherever you look, as the sort of starting point. So he, I get. Do you know what I was going to say? He wouldn't be in my list, but listen to me. He's clearly a bit of a hero <laughs> of mine. Um, uh, I've spent a lot of my time thinking about Howard Carter, and that goes back to 
you know, my time before I ever started studying Egyptology seriously, because the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun is such an inspiration. Um, he was a very interesting guy. Um, and also I think he gets a bad reputation somehow. I think, I think some specialists have a bit of a distaste for the idea of discovering lots of gold and treasure in a tomb in the Valley of the Kings, you know, as if it's somehow not scientifically, you know, important or robust enough, but of course the material is very, very important scientifically as well as being, you know, very blingy and um, sensational. And it's also true that he did a, he did a really, really fabulous job of, managing that whole immense, immense and challenging project. Um, he was by all accounts a very grumpy and difficult man, particularly towards the end of his life. Um, but, you know, uh, his achievement is, is, is very great. Um, if I could mention just two other people okay. um, who just spring, just spring to mind without really thinking about it. One of them is a Scot called Robert Hay, who uh, was in Egypt um, for two stretches in the 1820s, and his um, his project was to make a record of Egypt's archaeological sites and monuments in um, in sketches and notes, with a view to creating a comprehensive survey in published form of everything that was there. And he himself was an incredibly diligent and thorough artist and note taker. He also recruited lots of people who did a fabulous job for him, but the whole project defeated him in the end and he never published. Um, and his archive, which is vast, um, is now kept in the British Library. And it's, it's, it's well known within Egyptology, but not very well known beyond that. Um, and it's, I, I think in some ways it's a good thing that he never published because it, you know, it means that his archive has that much more mystery to it and also importance and it was a great opportunity for me i, I mean the, we could have filled the whole book with hay drawings oh. um instead you know we had to choose whatever a dozen or so the other person i would just i, I just want to mention is a guy called john pendlebury who who worked in egypt at amana in the 1930s he was an archaeologist and a good one again not without flaws and sometimes judged quite critically these days but he was also a great um, kind of pub publicist for archaeology and Egyptology and absolutely determined that unless archaeology and, and the work he was doing had meaning for a wider public, then there was no point in doing it. Um, and he, as a result of that, um, was a great sort of showman. He was a great speaker. He took the trouble to write popular accounts of his site his sites, um, as well as scientific reports. He recorded moving films, um, cinematograph films of his work, um, which have survived. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure I would have liked him. I think he was possibly a bit of an arrogant kind of so-and-so, but I, I love his work and his approach. Um, and he's in the book too. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, new projects coming down the pike? I hope so. Um, I, I'm just in the in the process after I can barely believe it, barely, barely believe it. I sort of feel as I'm rubbing my eyes a bit here, but after a year of being very, very busy giving lectures online, um, and, and, um, I wasn't writing during that time because as I said, I had just finished notebooks, um, just as the pandemic arrived and then the book was published, uh, in the autumn. Um, so I was busy promoting that, but I'm just beginning to get to the point where I'm having to think, okay, okay, okay. I could I could continue to occupy myself 100% with online lectures, but I'm going to need to get a new uh, book off the ground at some point. So I'm just in the process of trying to do that. Um, if you don't mind, I'm 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 going to keep what it might be under my hat for now. Okay. Um, but I hope um, in the next few weeks and months, um, maybe to be able to say a bit more. So maybe maybe we'll need to talk again. Uh, well, then, uh, what courses are you currently offering to the public? Well, at the moment, um, I'm I'm just offering one-off lectures. I, I haven't. I in some ways, I feel as though I haven't been very strategic about um, what I've been doing. I've I've um, for the last year, ba basically, always just wanted to make sure that I've got something in the diary in the next few weeks um, or, or a month or so. So, 
I've lost track of how many lectures I've given actually in, in the last year, but I did check. Um, I, I've been doing lectures for other people, but also hosting them myself. And I've had over 3000 registrations for my own talks. Um, that is probably, I don't know, that's maybe, maybe 20 talks, something like that. Um, but I've just been mainly picking subjects which, um, which arise from um, either my Lost Tombs book or Egyptologist's notebooks. I have been thinking about running sort of longer courses. Um, and if I knew that I was going to have six months or a year clear when I could do that, I'd love to do it. Um, but I, I guess, you know, the way the way this last year has been, yeah, you didn't we've really always been it. hoping that, you know, three months from now we might be back to normal and... Yeah, it's a bit difficult to plan, isn't it? Um, so, so well, yeah, watch this space. I, 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 one thing I would say is that even if we are back to normal at some point and I'm able to get out and go and visit people and do lectures in person again, as I really hope, I, I don't think um, there's any danger that online lecturing is going to go away. I think it's here to stay. Mm -hmm. um, but I can see myself carrying on doing it to some extent just probably alongside some some writing hopefully too yeah well uh, if people want to keep up on what you're doing where can they find you on the internet uh so they can find me um at my website www.chrisnaunton.com or uh, via facebook twitter and instagram um if you just search for at chris naunton you'll find me excellent well, I want to thank you for joining us today and telling us about what you're doing and the things you have done it's all very exciting um we, we love uh, Egyptology on this channel. Um, so I just want to thank you for, for coming out. Well, thanks so much, David. It's been a pleasure talking to you. You too. You might like my little e-booklet, Why Ancient History Matters. It's designed to persuade people that the subject is important, even in the modern world. You might also wish to use it to help spread the word. So feel free to share it with someone you know. It's free for anyone who wants it. I've left a link in the description box below the video for you to grab a copy. Catch you later.